I distinctly remember seeing the left wing, what I call giveaway. And once the left wing stalled, spin entry, stall spin crash. So we're here with Todd Simmons, the president of Cirrus Aircraft Customer Experience in his magnificent basement. We're with his brother Andrew Simmons and his friends Jeff Smith and Jim Richmond. And this summer they were in the Idaho backcountry doing some backcountry flying in carbon cubs and super cubs, something they'd done quite a bit of, only on this day things took a dramatic turn and they're going to share their story with us. Richard, we had already been in the backcountry a few days, and uh, on Thursday, June 21st, we got up that morning at Root Ranch. It was a pretty day in VFR, clear, uh, three airplanes and four of us together. We were looking forward to the day ahead. So let's move on into uh, the, the flight of the day then. So you hop into Cabin Creek, and then from Cabin Creek, you're going to move on to Dewey Moore. Is that right? We were right close to Dewey Moore, and I wanted to go into Dewey Moore because I always go into Dewey Moore and grab some rhubarb uh, okay. <laughs> because it's, it grows naturally. And yeah. That should tell you all you need to know about yeah. the planning and the things yeah. that are motivating us on yeah. this because, yep, let's go do that, and uh, this fishing's still ahead. But that's beautiful, that's a, that's isn't a very it? true part of the story. I mean, you're going to take your airplanes and you're going to go into <laughs> and just find a place for world-class rhubarb, right? <laughs> That is just outstanding. Oh, this, this was important. Yeah. <laughs> what we're thinking. All right, so, uh, so walk us through that, if you will, in the arrival there at Dewey Moore. And I think the first thing I remember over the radio was Jim saying, Andrew, why don't you fly over Dewey Moore to see if it's clear, airplanes, obstructions, deer, what have you, and then I'll go straight in. He'd been in the day before. He obviously and the knows concern that. is, is there other traffic there? Because Andrew flew over and said, nope, no other traffic. Then I can go ahead and make the approach. The wind was zero. And you so, guys are flying uh, in about a mile trail or so? About that. Approximately. Yeah, yeah, yeah no just in, in visual, uh, mm -hmm. keeping visual. Visual, 129 is the common frequency back there. That's mm -hmm. what we're talking on, listening for other traffic, staying to the right side of the, of the drainage. Like, you normally did. So you flew over and gave kind of a pie rep of the field and the traffic and so forth and reported that it's clear. And, uh, and that means, uh, Jim, that you'll be, you're the first one in to land. Right. from about a mile downstream and started descending down to the to the stream level so that uh, the end of the runway is, might be 20 25 feet above the water level okay uh, so you have to get right down in the in the drainage got it okay Dewey Moore it's a grass strip deep in the Idaho backcountry it has a 700 foot long 30 foot wide runway and it sits on top of a bank about 30 feet above the river's edge. From end to end, the strip has a 13% grade toward terrain with no room for error. You know, been to some of the most challenging strips, but I've not been into Dewey Moore, and that's of course a key part of this story. So both of you had been into Dewey Moore before. Okay, so now if you would walk us through, and I know at this point, uh, Todd doesn't have the memory to recall it, so I think, uh, Jim, let's go to your recollection. I came in and landed at Dewey Moore, and I, I rolled to the end of the strip. Todd wasn't in sight yet, so I walked back to the airplane, turned on the master, put the headsets on, and said, Todd, have you been in here before? And he just came back and said, nope. And I said, well, you can't be too low. Then he came into sight, and he was, pretty much where I expected to see him, right where Andrew had been, maybe 10 to 20 feet higher, but I don't think he was high. But he never really turned right at the, I was looking right down the end of the strip, and he never turned right and, and came right toward me. About the time he came into view, he pitched up and added full power. And that was a surprise. Yeah. And Andrew was getting out of his airplane or had just pushed it back, and when he heard that, he started running out and said, no, no. I mean, he knew too that that was the wrong thing to do. As Todd initiated his go around, it wasn't directly up and over the strip. It kind of faded a little bit more towards the middle of the land there of the triangle. 
and then made his left turn towards the river, towards another bit of rising terrain, a mountain, and then another left turn uh, to head downstream. At that point, I, I, I really became nervous. Yeah. Um, trying to make that turn at that point, I, I knew that was going to be challenging. Yeah. Regardless of the plane, regardless of the pilot, um, that's a that's a very tight space, a very tight turn um, with a lot going on. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, "This is not going to end well." Mm. Airplane is in the the last left turn, uh, head, heading starting to head back downstream, and I distinctly remember seeing the left wing, what I call giveaway. Stalled, mm -hmm. spinning tree, yep. and once the left wing stalled, spinning tree, stall spin crash. From our vantage point, um, the plane actually goes out of sight before it hits the ground. But for this part, um, what that meant is that before Todd hit the ground, we lost sight. Mm -hmm. okay. We heard the unmistakable crunch of metal, and we heard the engine stop instantly. Mm. Once you add energy back into the situation, very typically, when things are going bad, you're making them worse. And this is exactly what happened here. Mm -hmm. so it's I added energy back to into the situation. Know it, to, right. to read the words yeah. in a book that this is a no-go-around strip. Yeah. Uh, it's another thing to fully think through what that means. That would be so difficult to make in the moment. I, I don't think you can make that decision in the moment. You have I, to make that decision it, ahead of time. It has to be yeah. premeditated. Instinct takes doesn't? over in the moment. Yeah. Yes. And I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll put myself out there right now. Even, even though my landing was uneventful, I was not prepared fully for a no-go-around yeah. approach. Because had there been a deer on the runway, I, I don't know that I have the mental discipline to say, I'm going to hit that deer because that is a better outcome yeah. than me trying to go around. That is an incredibly difficult decision fact, to make. But if you prepare enough, you almost have to be thinking, when I turn this corner, I'm going to see a deer. Or, yeah. or I'm going to run into Jim's airplane at, at the top of the street. And I think an important point to add there is in my history of flying this airplane, in fact, I've, I've taken the engine to Lycon and even done the things to, to maximize the performance of the engine. Full throttle in this super cover in these carbon cubs, that's a lot of my out in that. So to the point here, it's a no go around strip. I have all this power. I'm going to use it right now as my out to go around. Instinct taking over mm -hmm. is working against me mm -hmm. in this case is the point. And then the drift to the middle versus the staying over the center line of the, of the airstrip becomes even more of a critical factor at that point. So tell us, Andrew, you're the first one to arrive. Um, what did you see? What, what was your uh, What I remember running down the hill, <laughs> in addition to screaming no, 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 and probably a few curse words and <laughs> some prayers and a lot of other stuff, um, I distinctly remember thinking to myself uh, that Todd is dead. You thought that's I, what I, you I, 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 I know, just as sure as I'm sitting here right now, that my brother's dead. Mm. And that's what I'm about to find. Um, when I crest the hill and see the airplane, I can see Todd in, in the airplane, but I can't really tell from the distance that I am exactly what his condition is. And so I ran to the airplane. Um, as, imagine I crest the hill and this is kind of what I see in this configuration damaged. I run underneath the left wing. I think that's just because it's the closest way. It's actually on a bank. I think I thought I could get easier access to Todd. So it doesn't seem like it had this kind of impact more, to your point, you thought it had more of a pancake impact. Because the, the bank was steep and the airplane, I believe, was descending like this, the, the approach angle between the airplane and the ground was pretty shallow. and. I think the left wing hit first, and then that pulled the engine over to hit this bank, um, and the left main hit. That tire ended up down right by the creek, and the airplane continued on around. It kind of wiped the engine under the left uh, gear a little bit, and continued on around and hit a bush and slid down. We found the airplane like that. The engine had been 
pointed down and, and aft. But it was a violent contact with the ground, but had the ground been level right there, it would have been much more violent. So you, you walk up to the run up to the left side of the so airplane. So what looks maybe yeah. from bird's eye view is a relatively intact airplane. When you get up to it, you realize it's very much not intact. And I'm looking at him from underneath the left wing. And again, all of the, the plexiglass or whatever has blown out. And so I have relatively easy access to him. He, again, he's <clears> leaning <throat> back into the left. He's still in his seatbelt harnesses. He was unconscious. Uh, he had this huge laceration going from the top left side of his face to the bottom right side of his face that essentially split his nose in half. I distinctly remember a very labored, shallow breathing pattern, mm. um, almost like a little gasp and then a little gasp. Um, and I guess part of me was thankful that, that he was alive because that's not what I expected. Uh, but then almost immediately you, you, you instinctively, I guess you, you go into fear. Okay. What do we do next? I've heard enough, read enough, seen enough to know that when airplanes crash, particularly Cubs, when you got the two fuel tanks sitting up right there and you got the fuel lines coming down, seeing the severed fuel line, smelling the fumes, um, there's a decent chance this is gonna catch on fire. And if that happens, this ends badly. Did you, did you handle that first, turning the switches off, or how did you, how did you deal with that? I, di I didn't do any of that. Okay. Um, w one of my biggest regrets of this, Todd, and I knew this, had a fire extinguisher right at his feet um, lessons learned. One of the first things I should have done is grab that fire extinguisher. Because at least if I had it in my hand and ready, had something ignited, I could have extinguished it or tried to quickly. <clears throat> as opposed to something igniting and I'm fumbling to get the fire extinguisher. Yeah, but understandably your focus is on your brother there, he's in bad shape, and so you're now you're trying to extricate trying him. Trying to attend to him. I don't, I don't flip any switches. I don't yeah. turn the fuel valve off. I'm trying to unbuckle and essentially my entire focus is on yeah. Todd and trying to get their attention. Yeah. And then not long, seemed like an eternity, but probably a few seconds, Jeff appeared. Jim appeared. We all realized what we needed to do. We got to get Todd out. I think I was in the front and Andrew some in unnatural way, because I still can't explain it, was able to get behind Todd reach over him and we got him out of the airplane you know and, and you know Todd hit the ground <laughs> right next to the airplane and then the three of us gathered ourselves and gathered Todd and took him down the hill. But that's interesting it, it took all three of you to extricate him from the airplane. It did. Svelte I am not. <laughs> Let's be clear here. <laughs> and yeah. he's being generous when he says dead weight. <laughs> yeah. um, when did you hit that yeah. SOS button do you remember? 1204. Yeah, but <laughs> where were you? Were you running or were you I there? thought you told me you weren't at the airplane yet. I do carry um, a DeLorme in reach, which is now a, a Garmin in reach. It's an earlier model than this one. Within the past couple of years, I have decided to carry it for exactly this reason. Even though you don't think an emergency is ever, ever going to happen, if it does, I have a better chance of surviving if I have this. And in, in addition, this particular device also allows me to text with just about anybody. So it's not a satellite phone, but it is essentially a satellite communication device via text. And so for the most part, I use it to text my wife when I can't reach her via cell phone. I've landed, I'm in the back country, I'm having a good time. I'm late, but I'm gonna be home. We're in a more challenging situation. I've got some trouble, but I'm okay. And then of course, the ultimate is pressing that SOS button where you, where you need help. But I do remember pressing it relatively quickly. I, I knew that this was a bad accident and I was going to need whatever resources SOS was going to get me. And important that that was on your person though. Luckily, I had decided uh, a couple of years ago um, that where I was going to keep this was in my, uh, I have a, a zipped pocket in, uh, in my pants on the left side. Um, and I have always decided to keep it there so that when I get out of the airplane, it's with me. Yeah. And I don't have to go looking for it. Yeah, I've heard it said that uh, from experienced backcountry pilots that camping equipment's what's in the back, survival equipment is what's on your body. Right. right. And this, you can see how this scenario where 
you saw this, you start running instinct, and then, oh my God, I gotta go back to the airplane and get my in reach, right? right. That would have been, been several more minutes. Of yeah, when, when I started running towards um, the crash site, there was no thought of going back to, get to the airplane to get anything at that point. Yeah. Um, and I was fortunate that that was in my leg, and yeah. so I press the SOS button, you, you hold it down, and it confirms that a signal is sent to um, an international rescue center. Um, uh, so I knew that had gone out or was in the process of going out. While we're on that equipment, let me take a little bit of a tangent here. Helmets in airplanes like Super Cubs and, and, and Carbon Cubs in the backcountry. What do you guys think about helmets? For Christmas this year, I bought myself a Bell helmet and a Halo microphone that I can put on under that. I'm not sure a helmet would have done Todd a great deal of benefit, but I can certainly see that a high percentage of the time in an accident, a helmet's going to help. And anymore, they're lightweight, they're, yeah. they're relatively comfortable. Um, well, certainly what you, you saw think? in skiing, you know, if you go back more yeah. than a decade ago, nobody's wearing a helmet and you've seen where that's come today. I, I will say, you're right, I, I do wonder what kind of helmet I would have had to be wearing to avoid, you know, the injuries to my face. I think it does speak to perhaps more of an awareness of what all's in the cockpit Obviously in 1954 mm, and 55 mm -hmm. when this airplane designed, unfortunately I'm probably not thinking about crashworthiness. You're probably not thinking of soft surfaces when I think about today and in in, in, you know, my place at Sirius Aircraft. That's all we've thought about yeah. for the design of soft surfaces. I also think, you know, there's different pilots have different preferences, whether it's headset hooks or other things that are portable in the airplane. Suddenly you give that a lot more thought in a case like this of quite frankly, the kind of things that you can hit. And, and you know, even as I think about the way I, if you will, impacted things in the cockpit, it's not straightforward. You can't really predict. So I think the helmet question is worth some thought about what you may have added to your cockpit, what's loose in the cockpit, the things that can hit you in the head. And I think the reality is it's way more than you might appreciate. So a helmet can still help, even though in this case, it's hard to say unless I'd had some protection literally right in front of my face. And we were talking earlier about, you know, I've, I've flown a carbon cub and you notice the stick is uh, lower than it is in a super cub, right? I mean, it's, it's one, of the, one of the first things you notice about flying it. But there's a real safety advantage in that and having that stick out of the way there. So there's no possibility of that uh, the really stick, which it. obviously is how we prefer to fly, is it was not part of this accident and yeah. not part of an injury that I'm aware of. And uh, down there out of the way, so that was good. Yeah. Speaking of the contents in the airplane, almost all the contents were thrown well away from the airplane. We found his iPad, his iPhone, his sunglasses, his headset, what, 20, 30 feet? Or more, yeah. Or more away from the airplane. That stuff left the airplane quickly and violently. Mm. The benefit of rebuilding the airplane as we did, you know, recently, um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, a very important STC and Super Cubs turns out to be the seat belts I was wearing. And, you know, the original design, those seat belts, unfortunately, and again, they're not thinking about it this many decades ago, are attached to the seat itself. Yeah. Of course, if that seat becomes unattached, those seat belts aren't helping you at all. Um, have what's called inertia reel seat belts in this seat belt. Of course, they go back and through uh, a partition in the back and they're connected to the fuselage in the back. And that was critical in this case. So not only do we have the benefit of the inertia reel, but we have the benefit that they're attached to the structure, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I had cracked ribs and a, and a cracked sternum and believe it or not, that's a good thing. That, yeah. that no doubt was just another place. If I don't have that or I don't have the benefit of the arresting that that's going on, I think uh, the injuries I suffered are magnified. Just, in fact, I know they are and, and almost surely fatally. So now you guys have them out, you've hit the SOS button and I think, is it, Jeff, you're an EMT or, or have some medical training, right? Yeah. How fortunate, how fortunate is that? Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, yeah. Another super important part of this story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, a, a long time ago, actually when I uh, turned 18, I had been uh, working on and was trained as a medic. So for about five years, I worked as a medic to kind of work my way through college. Hmm. Yeah. So you have some knowledge of how to help or where to go from here in terms of you know, uh, yeah. a life-saving maneuver. So what'd, what'd you do for that? Todd was gonna bleed to death or suffocate. Because of the trauma to Todd's uh, face and you know, nasal passages, everything that would typically be open was, was beginning to close because of swelling, because of, of clotting blood, because of the trauma. Um, so he was in, in those situations, your body's going into shock. You know, you're just trying to keep him breathing by keeping his airway open. Mm. Okay. Well, at some point right in there, we realized that we had 
uh, first aid kits. Uh, I had one in my airplane, you had one in yours. You ran up and got both of them, brought them down, and we just basically threw everything on the ground so we can see what we had. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, rescue, are you confident that you hit the SOS button, you've got a reception? So are yeah, you believing so that re rescue is on the way? They do send you almost instantaneously a confirmation that they have received your message. Um, and then not long after that, they start asking questions. What is the nature of your emergency? Um, I, you, you have the ability to pair via Bluetooth this device with your iPhone. Um, and I had done that because it's pretty easy to type in text messages on an iPhone. It's not as easy by a yeah. long stretch on this device itself. I so guess. as you're controlling the bleeding and then this process, you're also sending messages and confirming and making sure rescue yeah. is on the way. And then as he said, at some point, I mean, we, we knew we had first aid equipment. Of course, I didn't think to grab that on my way down the hill. I ran back up the hill, grabbed um, Jim's, grabbed mine. Todd had some in his airplane. We didn't necessarily think to go get that. but. We had plenty of first aid equipment, yeah. actually. The most important first aid supply was the coagulant that came out of the, mm -hmm. you know, that helped stop the bleeding in his mm -hmm. wrist. Mm -hmm. Everything else, you know, we didn't use this plant, we, maybe we should have, but. Well, I mean, there's there are a lot of lessons learned on this that are so powerful for the rest of us, but one of them that's just really standing out to me is those things are not optional in the back country, right? And even people that do front country flying, you mm -hmm. know, to think about, you find yourself in, in some kind of situation, those things are literally, literally life-saving. Yeah. Shouldn't be considered optional. So, um, Todd's airlifted out. You guys have a chance to, to take a breath and pause, but it's now probably relatively late in the day and you still have two airplanes in a, in a demanding trip, so now you gotta get out of there. What's in, in, in a fairly emotional state, right? So, I mean, we all talk about the mental preparedness to fly beyond everything else, and so how, can, can you just walk us through that? How did you? It was quiet Yeah. for a little while. I mean, right there at the, the tree guy site, I think we just sat for a minute yeah. <laughs> and didn't do much of anything. Yeah. I don't yeah. think we said anything to each other. We just kind of sat and paused and cleaned up. And cleaned up. Yeah. We had some trash bags and kind of cleaned up the, the mess you had made. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the messes I had made. There's an airplane sitting over there. They didn't put in a trash bag. But uh, you did that. And started to gather everything back up at the the two carbon cubs that were still at the top of the strip, including um, as much of the stuff that we could get out of Todd's airplane. Um, and I think we pretty quickly realized that we didn't have enough uh, useful load to carry everything out that we needed to carry, which is everything that we had originally in three airplanes, uh, now in two airplanes. And we were kind of leaning on Jeff during the first aid process of this, based on his knowledge, um, when it the next task became more of an, uh, an airmanship knowledge of, okay, now we have to safely get out of this strip and to where we need to be. <laughs> I quickly turned to Jim, <laughs> being the flying expert, um, uh, to help make those decisions, loading the airplanes, when do we want to leave, um, making the right preparations again, slowing down. And we discussed a fair amount. I remember the departure out of Dewey Moore, which is not a, it's not a no-brainer. It's a short strip departing as well as well, it is The weather later. had become a and weather had become a, an issue. An issue. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There was a moment there where I thought, okay, if we want to leave, we have to leave now. Mm. But I personally was uncomfortable leaving now because, you know, Andrew had just seen his brother go through a terrible accident, and we're all involved in this. And and you know, your body is still at, in some heightened state, you know. Mm -hmm. And now is not a good time to be calling on technical skills. I was much more comfortable waiting it out. Mm. I think we took 15 or 20 or 30 minutes maybe to evaluate you know, what we were facing and uh, it was not a, okay, let's get, let's get out of here and race Todd to the hospital, essentially. Yeah. We still had the benefit of the weather service inside the airplanes and we have XM weather so we could go in there and get a little bit of an idea of what was coming through. And we all three came to the same conclusion. So you, you waited out and then you, you leave and, and, and you head back home. Did you ever get the rhubarb? No. <laughs> <laughs> so he owes you at a minimum at a some minimum. rhubarb. At a minimum. <laughs> if I could undo this with rhubarb, we could. <laughs> yeah. Call it good. <laughs> Call it good, yeah. Yeah, even. <laughs>
Todd, I know that your, your memory stops uh, from Cabin Creek um, until when you recover in the hospital, which is another story entirely, the miraculous uh, recovery that you've had. Um, but I know you spent a lot of time uh, talking to these three and just analyzing it with your background in flying. So can you walk us through, as you look back on it, what are some of the lessons learned we can all take away from it? I'll refer back to planning and briefing and, you know, availing yourself to all information about this trip and, and really getting down to the issue of, are the pilot and the machine both ready to complete this mission today in terms of winning that trip? And the answer is no. Um, and, the, and the outcome, as you can see, is part of that. I think the second most important issue that I take away that candidly is causal is in fact my experience. Experience really in two types, total experience and recent experience. Probably checking the box in total experience, in the recent experience I'm not. Mm -hmm. Even though we had been out there for a few days, by no stretch of the imagination had we been to strips challenging like this one would tend to be versus the others that we had been to. If I had to summarize all my takeaways, I think I could simplify it in, in just saying, slow down and think. Just slow down and think. Yeah. And if you do that, what's your plan B gonna be? Something goes wrong. You'll probably if, if you slow down and think you'll probably do the right things, make the right decisions and have a successful flight. Yeah. Interesting. Jeff, how about you? So I'm I'm the lowest time pilot of this group and what what I take away from this, the stall spin scenario is something we're taught from the very beginning about how you avoid that situation. And and I think you made the point, Todd, you know, the training that we get is really not sufficient to educate you and make you understand how violent that event can be. Mm -hmm. It's made me think more uh, about the quality of my, my airmanship. I think you make a really good point on stall training, and we did a report on this in the, in the ASI about a year ago. But you know, if you think about most of the stall training that most of us go through, you know it's coming. Your instructor takes yeah. you up, let's do power on, let's do power off stalls, and like a super cub, it can take forever to get the airplane to finally stall on you, right? Because you're such a benign and you know it's coming and you know how to react. Right. As opposed to, that's why I'm such a fan of upset recovery training, where you get with people that do this for a living, and they'll put you in that situation without you being aware of it. Yeah. They'll throw it on you, right? So that suddenly there you are in this situation and now you have to deal with first the shock of it, then the reaction of it. So I, I really agree with you on, I think the training for that really needs to be, we really need to look hard at that. When I look at this uh, accident, I look at uh, four folks really highly experienced, some very highly experienced in the back country in airplanes that were built for the mission going out on what seems like such a, such a fantastic day. You know, I'm, I'm jealous of that ability to go, to go do that. I love that kind of flying. When you start peeling back the onion of, of, you know, what happened then, it looks to me like if you start, okay, it's a stall spin accident. What caused that? A go around on a one-way strip. What caused that? Possibly not just the assessment like you guys have said and like we've talked about, the real decision of going into a one-way strip and the decision that you're making going into that strip, that one way or another, you're gonna pass a point where that airplane's gonna be on the ground. And just a pause, as you guys have brought up to think through that, maybe is something that breaks the chain. Well, I wanna thank you guys for coming together and sharing your story and supporting general aviation safety, all of you do, and thank you for that. And especially you, Todd, for being willing to come out and share your story and, and share it with others. I think it's a key component of aviation safety. And as you know, in your job with Cirrus, how we've driven down the accident rate so successfully over the decades is people like you willing to come out and share your story. And then we sit and think about it and try to keep ourselves out of that same situation. Glad to do it. Thank you. And thank you, AOPA and ASI, for your commitment to the same.